In this video, I will expose the religion of Islam. I will begin with the pre-Islamic worship of the Arabs, the life of Muhammad, and end the video with evidence for any logical person to evaluate and research the information presented for themselves to prove that the religion of Islam is false and that Muhammad plagiarized his religion from other religious sects of his time. Allah is the name of the only God in Islam. The Arabic name for God is the word Alila. Allah is a pre-Islamic name coming from the compound Arabic word Alila, which means the God and is derived from the deity. It was a generic title for whatever God was considered the highest among gods. Different pagan Arab tribes used Allah to refer to its personal high God. Allah was being worshipped at the Kaaba in Mecca by the pagan Arabs prior to the time of Prophet Muhammad bin Abdullah. It was formerly the name of the chief god amongst the numericidal gods, 360 approximately, in the Kaaba in Mecca before Muhammad forced them into accepting monotheism, as the Jews worshipped during his time. The Encyclopedia of Religion states, Allah corresponded from the Babylonian god, Baal, and the Arabs knew of him long before Prophet Muhammad ever worshipped him as the supreme god. According to pre-Islamic doctrine, Allah was the god of the local pagan Chris tribe, to which Muhammad belonged. Allah was then known as Hubble the moon god, who had three daughters. Their names were Warat, al and al which were three goddesses. The first two daughters of Allah had names which were feminine forms of Allah. Historians have shown that the moon god, called Hubble, was the main god to whom the pagan Arabs offered their prayers at the Kaaba. And they used the name Allah when they prayed. I've already explained that the name Allah simply means the highest of gods or the chief god of the Kaaba. This name was used interchangeably by pagan Arab tribes to refer to its own particular high god. Hubble, the moon god, was the chief god of gods at the Kaaba amongst the other 360 idol deities. He was described as a man whose body was made of red precious stones and arms made of gold. Also, early Muslim historian like al could have said, Allah was actually the chief god of the other 360 idol gods being worshipped in Arabia at the time Muhammad rose to prominence. Historian Ibn al-Kalbi gave 27 names at pre-Islamic deities. History has shown that Mecca and the Holy Stone the Kaaba were holy sites for pre-Islamic pagan Arabs. The Kaaba in Mecca was formerly named Bi'af Allah, meaning House of Allah. The Quran tells us that Prophet Muhammad destroyed the other idols in and around the Kaaba, and made one god the only god and himself its holy prophet slash messenger. Prophet Muhammad kept the Kaaba as a holy, sacred place and confirmed that the Black Stone had sacred powers to take away man's sins, as also believed by the pre-Islamic pagan Arabs. Muhammad simply used the name Allah, the existing and regularly worshipped deity, thereby, without distinguishing it from the idol gods of the pagan Meccans. Muhammad's grandfather was a high priest and keeper of these idols. His own father was named Abdullah, Abdallah, which means keeper of Alila also known as Allah. This proves that Muhammad's grandfather and father worshipped Allah before Muhammad was born. Islam is simply a modified version of the pagan Arabs' former worship. Muhammad never told the Arabs to stop their worship of Allah, Muhammad just instituted worship of one of the 360 idol gods of the pre-Islamic pagans of Mecca. As you see, pre-Islamic Arabia worshipped Baal as Allah, which means the high god or chief god before the arrival of Muhammad. According to pre-Islamic history, there were numerous idol gods called Allah, every Arab tribe called their high god Allah. Muhammad simply took the god of his tribe which was Hubble, the moon god, and called him Allah, and destroyed all the other pagan idols. Again, Allah comes from the Arabic word Alila which means the god, which is derived from the deity. Allah is a title for whatever god was considered as the highest amongst gods. 
As I mentioned earlier concerning the name of Muhammad's father, in Arabic it's Abdallah, which is translated as Abdullah, should prove Muhammad's family pagan roots, and also prove that Allah was part of the polytheistic system of worship before Muhammad came, and made Allah the supreme and only God. Remember, Abdullah is the name of Muhammad's father, which means, slave of Allah, or keeper of Allah. What is quite certain is that the pagan Arabs in Mecca worshipped a moon god called Hubble at the Kaaba. Hubble was the lord of the Kaaba, being the highest ranking god of the 360 gods worshipped in the Kaaba. Now here is the amazing thing. Allah was also worshipped as the lord of the Kaaba. Yet, Allah was never represented by any idol of physical nature. To suggest the polytheistic Arabs never created an idol to represent Allah is simply unreasonable and unbelievable. We suggest rather, that Hubble was who the pagan Arabs addressed their prayers to Allah through. In other words, Allah was Hubble, the moon god. About 400 years before the birth of Muhammad, one Emir bin Lahia bin Karof bin, a descendant of Khatan and king of Hijaz, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba. This was one of the chief deities of the Quraysh, before the religion of Islam. Allah, or al Ayla is the Arabic name of the moon god Hubble, the crescent moon, the religious symbol in Islam, signifies Hubble, the moon god had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon god on the roof of the Kaaba, had put an idol called Hubble, the moon Muhammad was born A.D. 570, four years after the death of Emperor Justinian. He was descended from the tribe of the Quraysh and the family of Hashim. His mentality was prodigious. In his youth he was never taught to read or write, but his imagination was superlative. Muhammad was an extraordinarily handsome man, an eloquent and motivating man with the power of words. In the early years of Muhammad's life, he passed his time as a shepherd boy. We must remember that many successful men have risen from insignificant and humble conditions. Watching the sun by day and the stars by night left opportunity for Muhammad to contemplate in solitude and reflect on the events and profundities of this world. After Muhammad became a camel driver, he traveled to remote and intriguing lands. He led his caravans to Persia, Syria and Egypt, transacting business with merchants of every kind. On his business trips he met Jews, Christians, and members of other sects. He interrogated them concerning the tenets of their religions. He interrogated them concerning the tenets of their religions. He frequented the environment of the Jews and their rabbis. He frequented the environment of the Jews and their rabbis, mostly because they were merchants and an omnipresent ethnic group. Because he could not read or write, his ears were attentive and keen to everything that the Jews related to him. Muhammad learned and extracted much from the Jews, and compounded it with his new religion, Islam. Muhammad learned and extracted much from the Jews, and compounded it with his new religion, Islam. Coming to Yathrib, Muhammad found the inhabitants very hospitable to him and to his new religion. There were two factors that contributed to this hospitality. One. There were many influential Jews in Yathrib who were allies with the other Arabs. These Jews had introduced the conception of one God. Moreover, the Arabs were somewhat tolerant of the Jews. 2. On a pilgrimage to the temple in Mecca, some of Yathrib's best citizens had been converted by the teachings of Muhammad when he lived in Mecca. Finally, the pilgrims returned to Yathrib and disseminated their new religion. These converts could readily accept Islam because they were influenced to a great extent by the concept of the one God of the Jews. These converts could readily accept Islam because they were influenced to a great extent by the concept of the one God of the Jews. Eventually, Muhammad was proclaimed ruler of the city, and his honor, the name of Yathrib was changed to Medina.
The Prophet Muhammad adopted many principles and laws from the Jews. First of all, the basic idea of monotheism, which is the belief in one God. The Jews' confession of the unity of God is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. The Muhammad slogan is as follows, There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah. Muhammad adopted, also, the main details of the Jews' calendar, the Day of Atonement, the Sabbath, much of the Bible, and narratives from the Medrash, and many points of the ritual law. Incidentally, the Jews pray three times a day facing the city of Jerusalem, and the Muslims pray five times a day facing the city of Mecca. Trying his best, Muhammad sought to convert the Jews to his new religion, but to no avail. The Jews were adamant and resistant to change. The high esteem which the Prophet held for the Jews was transformed to enmity, and instead of allies, he looked upon them as competitors. Muhammad needed the confirmation of the influential Jews to validate his mission, as all upstarts need the backing of someone influential. Muhammad, therefore, turned against the Jews and became their tormentor. Muhammad tried to construct his religion as closely as he could after the Jews. He favored the Jews by accepting many of their laws and traditions. When the Jews refused to be converted, he commanded his followers to stop turning to the holy city of Jerusalem in prayer, but rather to turn to the city of Mecca. He changed the Jews' Day of Atonement or Fast Day, which he accepted for the month of Ramadan. Muhammad changed the Jews' Sabbath from Saturday to Friday. We have another parallel with Christianity. In the 4th century, the church changed the Sabbath to Sunday and reorganized its calendar to make Easter separate of Passover like Christianity. Also, Muhammad included in his Bible, the Quran, accusations concerning the Jews. Nevertheless, the Quran glorifies many biblical personalities. In order to win the pagans into the church, Christianity adopted many barbaric customs and traditions. Likewise Muhammad, to gain the loyalty of the pagan Arabs, adopted many of their beloved customs. The Kaaba stone, an idol, was to receive high regard in the new religion. Also the pagan temple at Mecca was to remain as a holy site. The fanatical stage of most revolutions is a bestial, ruthless, bloody, chaotic affair. The throats of men are cut from ear to ear. There is an absence of rationalization and extreme fanaticism sets in. So it was with Muhammad. He had come to a point of no return. He became a religious extremist in order to give his people a better life on a rapid scale. Muhammad came to the conclusion that all means of persuasion had been exhausted. The period of patience was past and he was now determined to propagate his religion by the sword. For he said, I, last of the prophets, am sent with a sword. The sword is the key to heaven and hell. All who draw it in the name of the faith will be rewarded. Muhammad became a martial prophet, and the pagans and stubborn Jews became his victims. In the year 627 the Battle of the Foss occurred. The Jews were defeated by the armies of Muhammad. 700 Jews were gathered in the marketplace and offered the alternative, the Quran or the sword. But the devout Jews were accustomed to martyrdom. They did not hesitate in their choice. Muhammad carried out his bestial threat, executed the Jews, and the women were sold. There was another city northeast of Medina called Chaibar. This city was the headquarter of the Jews' power in Arabia. After a long siege, the city capitulated to Muhammad. Under the rulership of Omar, the Jews of Chaibar were transplanted to Syria. Muhammad attacked tribe after tribe and caravan after caravan that were going to the city of Mecca. These acts enraged the Meccans and they equipped a large army to destroy Muhammad. In the ensuing battle Muhammad was almost killed. Finally, the Prophet marshaled his forces and entered in the city of Mecca. The entire city was abandoned because its inhabitants were afraid of Muhammad. Muhammad decimated the idols in Mecca. However, he did not demolish the temple. When the Meccans saw that Muhammad did not destroy their temple, they returned to the city and joined his religion.
Islam institutionalized slavery. Muhammad began to take slaves after he moved to Medina, and had power. Slaves were usually taken in raids on nearby Arab tribes, or were either, through offensive or defensive actions. Islam allows the taking of slaves as booty, or, reward for fighting. This has led to numerous jihads by Muslim states and tribes to attack other non-Muslim groups and obtain slaves. Islamic jurisprudence laid down regulations for the proper treatment of slaves. However, abuses have occurred throughout history. Muslims were enslaving black Africans long before any slave ships sailed for the New World. Muslims were taking and making slaves all over the lands they had conquered. Later, when, slave ships were loaded with black slaves, often, a Muslim slave broker had the human cargo, all ready to go. American slavers rarely had to go into inland to capture slaves, they were, already waiting there, courtesy of some Muslim ruler, and or slave broker. In many cases, if, the black slaves were not sent to the New World, they were sent to the Mideast to be, enslaved by Arabs, or kept by other black Muslims as slaves. I must admit that I too, among hundreds of millions of educated people, was under the impression that the African slave trade was the sole responsibility of the Christian Europeans, the white race. That is, until I started exploring the subject in greater depth, and especially after reading an incredibly enlightening book called The Legacy of Arab Islam in Africa by John Alambilla Azuma. My whole perspective and understanding has changed dramatically, and I would like you to tell us more about this subject. The success of Mohammedan Islam in deceiving, misinforming, deforming, and contorting, both history and reality, over a period of almost 1400 years has been astounding, that is, until now. The greatest tragedy about this particular subject is that most of the descendants of African slavery, the black people in the Americas, around the world, as well as among the African blacks, are totally ignorant of the actual facts. Before we lose the concentration of our listeners, I would like to make the following statement and then prove it that the worst, most inhumane and most diabolical institution of the black African slave trade was initiated, refined, perpetrated and implemented by the Mohammedan Arabs and later aided and abetted by the black converts to Mohammedan Islam. I predict that as usual, the two subcultures, those of denial of facts and of political correctness, will attack us without once disproving a single statement and or conclusion that we make. Slavery was not created by the white races because it has existed throughout a human history and practiced by every tribe, culture, civilization, racial group and religion. In fact, the very word slavery has its root in the name Slav, based upon the Slavic peoples of Europe who were subjugated by other Europeans. It is not common knowledge that the Arabic word Abd is synonymous with the meaning of slave. For example, Abdullah means literally the slave of Allah, and that in the language of the Arabs, all black peoples are called Abid, plural, for slaves. While much has been written concerning the transatlantic slave trade, surprisingly little attention has been paid to the Islamic slave trade across the Sahara, the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean. While the European involvement in the African transatlantic slave trade to the Americas lasted for just over three centuries, the Arab involvement in the African slave trade has lasted 14 centuries, and in some parts of the Mohammedan world is still continuing to this day. The birth of Mohammedan Islam and its conquests brought about the birth of institutionalized, systematized, and religiously sanctioned slave trade on a massive and global scale. In fact, the Qur'an allows the taking of slaves as booty or reward for wars of aggression against any and all unbelievers, most of the human population. This has led to an enormous number of so-called holy wars, jihad in Arabic. There was and is absolutely nothing holy about these wars which are primarily to plunder, slaughter, rape, subjugate and rob other human beings of their wealth, 
produce freedom and dignity. Mohammedan Muslim states and tribes attacked other non-Muslim groups to achieve these objectives. Although Islamic jurisprudence laid down regulations for the treatment of slaves, however, incredible and heinous abuses have occurred throughout the history of Mohammedan Islam. By the Middle Ages, the Arab Arabic word Abid was in general used to denote a black slave, while the word Mamluk referred to a white slave. Ibn Khaldun, 1332-1406, the preeminent Islamic medieval historian and social thinker wrote, the Negro nations are as a rule submissive to slavery because they have attributes that are quite similar to dumb animals. It should also be noted that black slaves were castrated based on the assumption that the blacks had an ungovernable sexual appetite. When the Fatimid Caliphate came to power in Egypt, they slaughtered all the tens of thousands of black military slaves and raised an entirely new slave army. Some of these slaves were conscripted into the army at age 10. From Persia to Egypt to Morocco, slave armies from 30,000 to up to 250,000 became commonplace. The Islamic slave trade took place across the Sahara Desert, from the coast of the Red Sea, and from East Africa across the Indian Ocean. The Trans-Sahara trade was conducted along six major slave routes. Just in the 19th century, for which we have more accurate records, 1.2 million slaves were brought across the Sahara into the Middle East, as well as a further 450,000 down the Red Sea and 442,000 from the East African coastal ports. That is a total of 2 million black slaves just in the 1800s. At least 8 million more were calculated to have died before reaching the Muslim slave markets. A comparison of the Islamic slave trade to the American slave trade reveals some extremely interesting contrasts. While two out of every three slaves shipped across the Atlantic were men, the proportions were reversed in the Islamic slave trade. Two women for every man were enslaved by the Muslims. While the mortality rate of slaves being transported across the Atlantic was as high as 10%, the percentage of slaves dying in transit in the Trans-Sahara and East African slave market was a staggering 80 to 90%. While almost all the slaves shipped across the Atlantic were for agricultural work, most of the slaves destined for the Muslim Middle East were for sexual exploitation as concubines in harems and for military service. While many children were born to the slaves in the Americas, the millions of their descendants are citizens in Brazil and the United States of today, very few descendants of the slaves that ended up in the Middle East survive. While most slaves who went to the Americas could marry and have families, most of the male slaves destined for the Middle East were castrated and most of the children born to the women were killed at birth. It is estimated that possibly as many as 11 million Africans were transported across the Atlantic, 95% of which went to South and Central America, mainly to Portuguese, Spanish and French possessions. Only 5% of the slaves ended up in what we call the United States today. However, a minimum of 28 million Africans were enslaved in the Muslim Middle East. Since at least 80% of those captured by Muslim slave traders were calculated to have died before reaching the slave markets, it is believed that the death toll from 1400 years of Arab and Muslim slave raids into Africa could have been as high as 112 millions. When added to the number of those sold in the slave markets, the total number of African victims of the Trans-Saharan and East African slave trade could be significantly higher than 140 million people. What is obscene about this whole subject is the Mohammedan Muslim and Arab culture of denial regarding their complicity in the African slave trade, as well as the ignorance of black Muslims about the reality of their past and present conditions. The statistics and reports above are based upon the logbooks kept at the African slave ports, ship logs, travelers' reports, eyewitness accounts, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, the facts and reality of Mohammedan Islam's complicity 
in the slave trade and their inhuman depravity are infinitely more devastating, more staggering, and more incomprehensible than all the nightmare fictions in the world. government needed to do was to lay on a, a couple of Antonov cargo planes and all of these people would have been here in a few hours and in comfort rather than three weeks in a cattle truck. For centuries, Sudanese Arabs have been taking the black tribal people from Sudan as slaves for their personal use, as well as exporting them to the Middle East and beyond. Today, this practice continues under the approving eye of Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir. The uh, Sudanese military and its agents, militias that it armed, were the ones carrying out the slaves, the slave raids, and they used government transport, a train, to help bring these troops in and in some cases carry the slaves back en masse to the north. There's uh, plenty of evidence that this uh, crime against humanity was done with the assistance and um, under the direction of the Sudanese government. They've been, they've been part of this slavery regime. They weren't naive about it. They weren't um, uh, ignorant that this slavery was going on. Um, it suited their purposes. It was only when we came to this area in the borderlands with, uh, between northern and southern Sudan that we uh, saw the devastation of the slave raid for the first time and encountered people who had been enslaved and who had either escaped or their families had redeemed them uh, from bondage. going on here. While the peace talks are at effect in Nairobi between the Sudan government and the SPLM SPLA, the Sudan government has launched its inhuman act today and targeted Malwalkon on the 23rd of June year 2002. As now you are seeing an innocent life lost to the shrapnels of Antonov. Yeah, this is one of the examples we should show to the international community and those who have been talking all the time that Sudan government is genuine in its quest for peace. A peace with such acts. A peace covered with blood. The blood of the innocent who don't know what they are up for. These are the victims of 
the real Southern Sudanese people who are left to the mercy of NIF in Khartoum and their allies worldwide. Local community leaders uh, here have given estimates uh, that would suggest that over 200,000 have been enslaved over a 20-year uh, over a 20-year period. The thought of human beings for sale moved me to taking action. As a filmmaker, I wanted to expose the atrocities and give a voice to those who have none. The most shocking thing happened to me. A small child was slaughtered and the head severed from the body. The Arabs forced me to carry the head. For five days, I was forced to carry that head, even though it had started to decompose and produce a strong stench. On the fifth day, they told me to throw the head by the wayside and to set it on fire. Although I became a slave and worked night and day herding the master's cattle, I think that all the bodily pain and suffering was less heavy on my spirit than the carrying of the head of the dead child. My master was called Hassan Abdul Rahman from Lagawa. A lot of Dinka tribesmen have remained behind as slaves of the Arabs. I hope that those who brought us back to Dinka territory can also do something to bring them back too. In 2004, I first traveled to Sudan to participate in slave liberations with human rights workers from Christian Solidarity International, a Swiss organization. These slaves are people with hopes and dreams. Even those who were born into slavery knew that they were meant to be free. Well, welcome to your home. John, John Ivan. Once I came face to face with these individual slaves, I immediately connected with them. And I knew that I had to make this documentary. How many men did this to her? How many men actually caught her and cut her throat? There are four men. I was taken down and I was raped at the same time. When they were doing this? Ah, yeah. You mean they cut her throat and then raped her? As she? Ah, she, uh, when she becomes unconscious, caught my hand and legs and uh, one, of, one of them came with a knife. Today, there may be over 100,000 slaves in Sudan still in captivity, and more slaves are being captured from the Darfur genocide. Just like the genocide in Nazi Germany, Many nations in the world refuse to acknowledge that slavery exists and therefore refuse to liberate them. These slaves have disappeared and remain hidden in the darkness. Uh, I wish that more organizations uh, would get involved and take away from us this big burden of responsibility. We have mentioned it to other organizations that we are doing this and that we would like them to get involved and assist CSI in this work, but to no avail. Yes, and in the absence of any other organizations, we will carry on, and our president has said repeatedly, we will carry on until the last slave is freed. My Slave, My Infidel is a one-hour documentary film I have produced in order to show you their faces, tell you their names, share their stories, and allow you to hear their cry for help. Christian boys kidnapped from the villages are confined to an Islamic school where they are made to study the Arabic language and memorize the entire Quran.
Rising for prayers before dawn and studying until the late hours of the night, they are indoctrinated into the strict teachings of the Islamic faith. Those who refuse to cooperate are beaten and chained until they improve their studies. Those who refuse to cooperate are beaten and chained until they improve their studies. They must give up playing. Playing is harmful. It doesn't allow them time to study. Anyone who misbehaves, he's whipped so that he doesn't play anymore. When his colleagues see him being whipped, he will stop playing and become afraid. The Quran is difficult. If they do not work hard, they will not be able to memorize it all. A lot of the footage that we have received from these nations, some in Sudan, show uh, young boys being beaten. Uh, showed them chained, walking down these dusty paths around the school compound with chains. In one school, they have to write on a small board that they carry with them uh, Quranic verses and then wash this board and drink the water. And their teachers tell them that drinking this water causes them or helps them to memorize this faster. And their teachers tell them that drinking this water causes them or helps them to memorize this faster. Young girls have also been kidnapped and sold as concubines or given over to the sexual pleasures of the Islamic soldiers. Young girls have also been kidnapped and sold as concubines or given over to the sexual pleasures of the Islamic soldiers. Girls as young as nine have been repeatedly violated. Tens of thousands of children have disappeared, hidden away by radical Muslims seeking to create a new generation void of any Christian faith. Christian men who refuse to submit to the Islamic movement have been imprisoned, beaten, and oftentimes mutilated. Others have been hung, nailed to trees, or drowned in the River Nile. Muslims around the world today worship as the pagan Arabs worship before and during the life of Muhammad. The worship of Hubal, the moon god, to the worship of the Kaaba, are being worshipped as the pagan Arabs worshipped in pre-Islamic history. Muslims insist that they no longer worship idols, and Prophet Muhammad came and destroyed all of the idols.